Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Pastor Doug McLean from New Testament Baptist Church in Hamilton, Ontario. And it's my joy to welcome you uh, to our morning service uh, today on May the 24th, uh, the year 2020, and to trust that God will use the service to be a blessing to you. And as always, we would encourage you to let us know how God has spoken to your heart, and if we might further be a blessing to you after the service has concluded. Uh, I'm going to ask you if you'd take the Bible, the Word of God, this morning and turn with me to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 64. I'd like to read that chapter with you uh, as we begin the service, Isaiah 64. I want to tell you this is what we would perhaps identify as a cry for revival. Um, the, definitely the elements are found there in Isaiah 64. And uh, I hope you'll watch for them, and I hope you'll pay close attention as we read and, and get the heartbeat of, of the cry from the lips of Isaiah here in Isaiah 64. And then we'll be referring, referring back to this passage eventually in this morning's message. So I'm reading now, beginning in Isaiah 64 and verse number 1. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, that thou wouldst come down that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we look not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth, and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned. In those is continuance, and we shall be saved." But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as a filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. There is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities." But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Be not wroth very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. Thy holy cities are a wilderness, Zion is a wilderness, Jerusalem a desolation, our holy and our beautiful house, where our fathers praised thee, is burned up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? And I'm going to read again the first phrase of verse 1. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, that thou wouldst come down. And there's the burden of Isaiah and the cry for revival in his day. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word and to our consideration of it later in this service. All right, we're going to take our hymnals now. And we're going to turn in our songbook uh, to number 297. Number 297, the song is Open My Eyes That I May See. If you see the words on the screen, we invite you to join in singing with us. <clears throat> Open my eyes that I may see Glimpses of truth thou hast for me, place in my hands the wonderful key that 
shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Shall I fear while yet thou dost lead? Only for light from thee I plead. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Trophies of grace to Christ my King. Echoed in love, thy word shall outring. Sweet as the note that angels sing. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to Open my way, illumine me, Spirit divine. Now we're going to sing number 469. And the song asks the question, who at my door is standing? Number 469. At my door is standing, patiently drawing near, entrance within demanding, whose is the voice I hear? Sweetly the tones are falling, open the door for me. again is he. Jesus art thou not weary, waiting so long for me. Sweetly the tones are falling, open the door for me. If thou will heed my calling, I will abide with thee. My heart I hasten, thee will I open wide, though he rebuke and chasten, he shall with me abide. Sweetly the tones are falling, open the door for me. Well, this is uh, the time when we usually read 
a letter from one of our missionary family. And I had a couple today, one from uh, Nepal and one from Couriers for Christ. However, I received a, a letter last night or an email last night, read this morning, and I thought, I think I will share that with the church instead of a missionary letter. Now, the reason being is that for many years, part of our missionary family were Charles and Nina Hollingsworth. And Charles and Nina were serving the Lord in planting a church in Cold Lake, Alberta. And, uh, and the Lord has since moved them from there. And uh, they were looking for a pastor. And they've had a few different individuals who uh, have been helping look after the work of the church. And then uh, not too long ago, the Lord uh, laid it on the heart of the church to call Jason Yellowknee uh, to come and be their pastor. I met Jason for the first time um, almost two years ago now when we went to the National Pastors Meeting out in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. And he preached a message, and wow, I was impressed with his love for the Lord and his knowledge of the Word of God, and, and he was just kind of doing the work of an evangelist, but God has uh, put it in his heart to be the pastor, and uh, he writes now as the pastor of the church there in Cold Lake, Alberta. And so since you've invested a lot in terms of finances in that work over the years, I thought it would be good for you to hear this. So this is a letter from Jason Yellowney, the pastor. I trust this message finds you well. I'm praying for many of you who are frustrated by limitations concerning worship. Lakeside Baptist is set for our new parking lot auditorium service as I write this message. I'm excited about what the Lord is going to do tomorrow. May I say this to start? Hurting churches are not lost causes. This church was ready for a pastor, and the Lord immediately began working. Pat and Judy Hollingsworth, and that's uh, Brother Charles' uh, dad and mom, and they were there in the church. They practically embraced my family as part of their own. This allowed people to get behind us quickly. Imagine an experienced older pastor yielding to a young man and submitting. A truly humbling experience. Brother Hollingsworth has helped me focus on helping others above everything else. Far too often, we're like dogs that sink their teeth in and do not let go. People began to let go of hurts, and the church began to grow spiritually, numerically, and experience financial blessings. I've begun to relax more and finally become the family man my family has needed. It's so hard to shut off the switch, and my wife has put up with so much intense zeal and world-altering visions that never quite came together. COVID struck, and I thought all forward progress would stop. Fear gripped my soul. I told my wife that I should get a job to take the burden off the church. I thought we would use the bank account to help those who had lost their jobs. The men of the church flat out rejected such a notion. What happened? The offerings tripled. The gospel was sent to our whole region. Contacts have been made, and the Lord started working on me. I started writing acrostic poems to express the emotions of hurting people in our church and city. Where did I learn to do that? Mrs. Susan Smith, speech class at Faithway Baptist College back in 2000. What happened? Well, I sent the poems as a gift to our church family. Then Brother Steve Donnelly, you know, the one who prods us, uh, prods all of us about the North all the time, encouraged me to list it with Amazon.ca. What happened then? Acrostic Creations went number one in poetry and number one in hot new releases last week. Amber and I are stunned. Brother Donnelly is currently writing the foreword for my second acrostic poetry book, an ebook entitled Emotional Traffic. We often project ourselves as confident and all knowing problem solvers. The truth of the matter is this. 
I never felt I could live up to expectations or shake the stigma of being a kid from an Indian reserve with a messed up background. It produced an unhealthy drive in me and a continual fear of failing and being what everyone truly saw in me. But the Lord enabled me to take a hurting church, and we have experienced healing and true freedom. Please continue to pray. Like Lakeside Baptist Church is a church that loves people. It allows individuals to grow, including their preacher. Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord for what God is doing. We often pray for those churches without pastors, and God has heard and answered the prayer in this case. And uh, thankful for Brother Jason Yellowney. I hope you get to meet him sometime. He's quite a character and does love the Lord and does have an intense zeal and drive, and uh, we appreciate that. Uh, also, I, we do not support, uh, personally, Eli and Katie Giltner. They're missionaries uh, to Japan with Baptist Missions to Forgotten People. But I want to share this prayer request with you before we spend a moment in prayer. Uh, I won't read their entire letter, but in this latest letter that I have received from them, uh, they say, last but not least, one of Katie's Muslim friends she was witnessing to from our language school days here in Tokyo recently accepted Christ. Praise the Lord for that. But then she writes, violent situations, depression, and suicide attempts made her once again open to hearing the gospel. She remembered Katie had given her the gospel five years ago, and she chose Christ even knowing that her family would utterly reject her. She lives in Malaysia with her family and is potentially in danger of death as it's a Muslim country that forbids conversion. Please pray specifically that she's able to get back her passport that her parents are keeping locked away. She's being abused very badly right now by them. Please pray she can escape for her life as soon as possible. If you would like to be a part of helping her, please feel free to contact us about it. So we don't know much about her except that she's a friend of Katie's who has trusted Christ as her Savior and whose life is in danger. So would you join me in praying for her? And uh, let's pray together as well for Lakeside Baptist Church in Cold Lake, Alberta. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this report of how you have supplied a pastor for a, a, a church without a pastor, without a shepherd, and a church that was hurting. And we thank you for this wonderful testimony from Pastor Jason of what you're doing in his life and in their lives. And, and we're excited today to hear what will happen as they meet uh, for parking lot church there in Cold Lake. Father, we do thank you for Eli and Katie and uh, their faithfulness to serve you in Japan. And we're thankful that after many years, a seed that was sown has taken root and one has come to trust Christ as Savior who was lost in a false religion. And now, Father, you know all about her circumstances. You know that her life is in danger. And Lord, you know uh, how to keep her from harm and how to deliver her. Uh, for your word says that you know how to deliver the godly out of temptation. And so we lift her up to you. We just pray for your intervention and uh, for your grace and strength in her life. And we rejoice that she's come to know Christ as Savior. And Father, we do pray that you'll honor your word being preached in this service. And in the services and pulpits across our land today, send revival to our hearts and to our churches and to our land, and we'll give you thanks and praise. Bless all of our missionary families today as they serve you wherever they are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, thank you for praying with me, and thank you for caring for our missionary families. And uh, we will be uh, trying to keep you informed as we hear from them what God is doing in their lives individually and together. All right, we're going to take our songbooks and sing again right now. Uh, we're going to go to song number 870 in our hymn book, and it's called Come Holy Spirit. As we sing this song, can I invite you to, um, when you get to the course, if you can remember, I'd like to invite you to personalize it. So when we sing, Come Holy Spirit, the, the chorus says, Come Holy Spirit, dark is the hour. We need your filling. I would like you to personalize that and say, I need your filling, your love and your mighty power. Move now among us instead of us. I would again invite you to personalize that. Move now within me. 
stir me, I pray. Instead of stir us, we pray. Stir me, I pray. Come, Holy Spirit, revive my heart today. So it says revive the church, uh, my heart. So if you can remember that, if not, that's okay. You can sing it as the words are on the screen, but I would encourage you to try to remember to personalize it as we sing it together. Come, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. He came in mighty fullness then. His witness through believers won the lost, and multitudes were born again. The early Christians scattered o'er the world. They preached the gospel fearlessly. Though some were martyred and to lions hurled, they marched along in victory. Come, Holy Spirit, dark is the hour. I need your filling, your love and your mighty power. darkness grip the earth the just shall live by faith was learned the holy spirit gave the church new birth as reformation fires burn in later years the great revivals came when saints would seek the lord and pray Oh, once again we need that holy flame to meet the challenge of today. Come, Holy Spirit, dark is the hour. I need your filling, your love and your mighty power. that indeed be the desire of our heart. He has done it before, and he can do it again if we will allow him to do what he longs and purposes to do. Well, this morning before the message, we are privileged to have a special in song uh, recorded for us uh, by Miss Abby Tyrrell. I trust will minister to your heart. Oh, Abby, tricky. Sorry about that. Let's enjoy.
Oh, thank you so much, Miss Tricky. That was a blessing. Thank you for being willing to sing for us today. And it kind of fits right along with what I want to say this morning in this message. Turn in your Bible, if you would, please, uh, to the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea in the Old Testament. So if you can find the larger books of, uh, of Ezekiel and then Daniel, the book following Daniel is Hosea. Hosea, and we're going to be in chapter 5 to begin with. I'm going to start in verse 15. And then read into chapter 16. We remember that when the uh, prophecies and the words of Scripture were written, they were not written um, with chapter and verse divisions necessarily. They were written in sentences and paragraphs and so forth. Uh, but uh, we have uh, used chapter and verse divisions in order to enable us to find things more readily and divide uh, things as they seem to appear in thought. And so we're going to read uh, chapter 15 and verse uh, chapter 5 and verse number 15, and into chapter 6 uh, through verse number 3 to begin with. All right, reading in Scripture now, uh, Hosea chapter 5 and verse 15. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. Come. Let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning. And he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain upon the earth. I want to entitle the message this morning, Knocking on God's Door. Knocking on God's Door. As we looked at verse number 15, the voice uh, that is speaking is God. I, God says, through his prophet Isaiah, I will go and return to my place. So we're going to think for a moment about God's place. You know, we'll be driving through town and uh, perhaps we've got somebody that uh, is unfamiliar with the area and we know the area and, and we will say to them, hey, uh, right over there, see that red house? Uh, that's John's place. Or we'll say over here, that's uh, Bill and Betty's place. And so we're talking about uh, their dwelling, their home. Well, God has a home. God has a place. And he said, I will go and return to my place. Now, the Bible also says in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 21, as well as Micah chapter 1 and verse 3, it speaks of God coming out of his place. So here in, in uh, Hosea, God goes into his place in Isaiah and in Micah, we have the expression, he cometh out of his place. And in those two places, it, it, it is in the context of judgment. So God is coming out of his place to judge. I also want to point out to you that as we read the book of Isaiah, we come to Isaiah 28 and verse 21, and we read that God's judgment, the work of judgment, is called God's strange work. So he comes out of his house 
in, the, in those two passages I mentioned uh, to do judgment. And judgment is called his strange work. The word strange carries the idea is that it's not what he wants to do or it's not what he's known for. It's not what he delights in, especially if the judgment has to do with his children. That's a strange work. He, as the father with his children, wants to love them and protect them and provide for them. So if he has to come out of his place to punish or to judge, it's a strange work. Now, in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter number 3 and verse number 20, uh, the Lord Jesus has asked John to pen letters to seven churches in Asia. And to the church of Laodicea, the last of the seven churches which, by the way, is a church, I believe, intended to represent the characteristic of the church age in which you and I live. We have those familiar words, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, as God writes to the church of Laodicea. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and will open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. So God is knocking at the door of the church, at the door of the instrument he's chosen for his glory. And by virtue of the fact that the church is made up of individuals, he's knocking at our individual hearts wanting to come in. We sang about that just a few moments ago in our song service. Then in Matthew chapter number 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, we have Jesus giving instruction and saying, Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find, and then knock, and it shall be opened unto you. It is the believer's privilege to knock at the door. I'm going to suggest to you to knock at God's door. God knocks at our door. But you know, sometimes we'll go visit somebody and we'll knock at the door and they're not home. Or... Perhaps they are home, but they don't want to talk to you. Maybe they know that you've come to, uh, maybe they're uncomfortable because they know they owe you something or they have uh, done something wrong and you may not even know about it, but, but they feel guilty. So they know you're at the door, but they act as though they're not home. And so eventually you stop knocking and you return and go to your place. Now, perhaps... In time, they will come to your place and knock on your door. So I'm talking to you this morning about knocking on God's door. God says here, I'm going to return and go to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. You'll remember that in the past few weeks, we've looked at several thoughts. We looked a few weeks ago at the idea of the question that's on everybody's mind, how long, O oh Lord? And we reminded ourselves that there are two sides to every story. While we as the people are saying to God, our creator, our father, the potter, how long, O oh Lord, before you come and address the circumstances, God is also looking at us and saying, how long, my people, before you turn from your sin, before you get serious about living for me, before you obey my commandments and respect uh, my statutes? So we saw the how long on both sides of the picture. And then last week we were looking at Psalm chapter 80, where the people uh, were asking God to, to return or to come unto them and to cause his face to shine. And then in the same chapter, in three verses of Psalm chapter 80, they recognize that they need to turn. So they're asking God to turn. And yet they know they need to turn. And so they said, turn thou us, that thy face may shine upon us, and we shall be saved. And so we, we see this reciprocal relationship. And what I'm trying to teach you, uh, church family, is this, that sometimes it's all one-sided with us. All we think about is what we want and what we need and what we deserve without, without ever stopping to think about the fact that God was first. And then we came after, and we came only by God's gracious gift of life. And God gave us everything, and God promises to be our everything. But it's we that have departed from Him. 
And so we're never hardly thinking about our need to return to him, about how long he's been waiting for us. The fact that, that we need to go knock on his door, but we're wanting him to knock on our door. And so this morning, I'm, I'm saying to you that as we enter into this week where we're going to be challenged by messages on revival through the Canadian uh, online uh, revival uh, conference, I want you to be thinking about a knocking on God's door. That's where I believe you need to be, and that's where I need to be. Now, where is God's door, or what, what is God's place? I'm going back to Psalm 80, where we were last Sunday morning. Psalm chapter 80, and I want you to notice something that we didn't speak much about uh, last week in verse number 1. So verse number 1 reads, Give ear, oh, remember that? We're always asking God to give ear, but we looked in Scripture and saw that God is saying He can't bless us because we refuse to give ear to Him. So again, we see that reciprocal relationship. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. It's that last phrase that I want you to think with me about. Thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. If you were to look ahead to Psalm chapter 99 and verse number 1, we read, The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth, where? Between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. So here in Psalm 80 and in Psalm 99, we have this expression of God sitting or dwelling between the cherubims. Well, if you're a Bible student, you probably know that in the Old Testament, God directed uh, Moses and the children of Israel to build him a, a dwelling place, a tabernacle uh, upon the earth that would be in the midst of their camp. Go back with me to Exodus chapter 25. And the tabernacle, the place uh, of God's dwelling while the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness, was basically a tent. And the tent was divided into two major components, the holy place and the holy of holies. And the innermost part of that tent was called the holy of holies. And, and that was the place where God was said to dwell. And God had it directed Israel to build a, a, what we call an ark or a box uh, called the ark in, to, to, to be in that holy of holies. And the lid of that box was called the mercy seat. I'm going to read with you about it. Uh, I don't have time to read everything, but starting in verse 10, the ark is made of shittim wood. It's overlaid with gold. And, uh, and inside the ark, you're going to put the testimony, the Ten Commandments that was given. That's in verse 16. Then verse 17, thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims, two angelic beings, of gold, of beaten work, shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. So you have the lid of the ark, and on both ends of that lid, which is called the mercy seat, you have a cherubim made of gold. And you make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims B. Can I give you a little illustration here? If you can look at me, watch me. Uh, here, here I am, a cherubim, and uh, and and those there are folks who have always considered me to be an angel, right? <laughs> anyway, I'm a cherubim for the sake of illustration, and I've got wings, and uh, I stretch forth my wings toward the heaven, and my face is toward the mercy seat. So I bend over like this toward the mercy seat. So my face looking on the mercy seat. And the cherub opposite me is doing the same thing. So basically our wings are touching over the mercy seat. And that's the picture that we get. And so in Psalm chapter 80 and in Psalm 99, we're talking about a God who dwells between the cherubims. Back in Exodus chapter 25, and I closed my Bible before I should have. I left that passage. I'm going back there. Exodus chapter 25 and verse number 22. And there, 
there on the mercy seat uh, with the golden cherubims. There I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from be above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are on the ark of the testimony of all things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So it was the meeting place of God's people with God, the mercy seat. Now, I don't have time again to go into all of this, but in Leviticus chapter 16, we learn that, that the blood of a sacrificial lamb, the atoning blood of a lamb slain for the sins of the people was to be brought by the high priest into the Holy of Holies, and the blood of the sacrifice was to be sprinkled upon the mercy seat. And so the picture is clear that we have the privilege of meeting God because God is merciful. God dwells in a place characterized by mercy. Yes, the Bible says justice and judgment are the habitation of His throne. But do you know in the book of Exodus, when Moses desires to see God, and God says, I'm going to cause my glory to pass by before thee, do you know what the first thing that is mentioned in, in, in introducing God and God's name it was this, mercy. First mention, the Lord merciful. God is merciful. Church, I want you to get a hold of this this morning. Our God has a place, and His place is a place characterized by mercy. Now, that's the Old Testament. That was the meeting place of God with His people, and that's where God dwelt, in the place of mercy. And if we'll come humbly and confessing our sin, and we will come uh, by means of a blood sacrifice, we may obtain mercy from Him. And the Bible says He keeps mercy for thousands. You know the very first time the word mercy is mentioned in the Bible? It's mentioned in reference to Lot and his family. God has come down and is going to destroy the entire city of Sodom and the city of Gomorrah for their wickedness. And God has warned <coughs> Lot and his family to flee from the city. And they're a little bit reluctant to do so for some reason. Indicating what we already know about the stubbornness of a human heart. The Bible says that the angels whom God sent laid hold of Lot and his family and directed them out of the city. But you know what it says? It says it this way, the Lord being merciful unto him. What God did in taking a hold of him and taking him out was mercy. That's the first mention of the word mercy or merciful in Scripture. God not having to do it, and Lot not, be, not being worthy of it, although Lot was a righteous man, according to the New Testament, God in mercy dealt with him. So the God with which we have to do, the God who in Hosea chapter 5 and verse 15 is returning to his place in the Old Testament, we know it to be a place of mercy. Now, what about the New Testament? We don't have the tabernacle anymore. Uh, we don't have the Ark of the Covenant. Let's go to to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation in chapter number 4. So after the letters to the seven churches are completed in Revelation 2 and 3, then a door is opened in heaven, and John is invited to come up. And he comes up and he tells us what he sees. And he says in verse 2, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one sat upon the throne. So you see the throne and someone sitting there. He that sat was to look upon like jasper and sardine stone. And watch, there was a rainbow. Picture this in your mind. There's a throne. Someone seated on the throne. And a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Wait a minute. Does that word rainbow ring any bells with you? Where, where, where does the rainbow come from? Was it not given as a sign set in the heavens for God to remember His covenant never to destroy man with a flood again? 
God who had seen his son, uh, the sins of his people and God who determined to destroy men from off the face of the earth said, I'll never do that again. And so he set the rainbow in the sky. So what's the rainbow a picture of? My dear friend, it's a picture of mercy. Man still sins against God, but the rainbow is a picture of God's covenant of mercy. And I want you to know that in the throne room of God, the place where God dwells, his place, heaven, there's a rainbow round about the throne. Oh, I like that. By the way, you'll notice in verse 5, also out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So we see lightnings and thunders. We do know that judgment and justice proceeds from the throne. But listen to me, the first thing that impressed John as he saw the throne was this rainbow round about the throne, which indicates that the throne of God in heaven is a seat of mercy. And by the way, who is on that throne? Look at verse number six of chapter five. I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a Lamb, capital L, a lamb as it had been slain. That, that language indicates that this lamb was a sacrifice. This lamb offered itself and was slain for another. And this, of course, is Jesus, the blessed lamb of God in the midst of the throne. So we have the mercy seat. The throne circled by the rainbow, which is a, a symbol of God's mercy, and the blood, the lamb slain. And then I want you to notice in verse number 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And verse 9, they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast... Uh, slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred tr tr uh, and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and so forth. I'm saying to you this, when we're thinking about God going to his place, I want you to know the, God, the place where God dwells, God's home, God's seat is a place of mercy. Oh, that ought to make you glad. You ought to delight in that for he is all powerful. He is all, uh, he is holy. He is just and he is righteous and yet he is merciful. Oh, do you know what the Bible says about mercy? 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 14, David testifies. He's given a choice and he says this, quote, let us fall now into the hand of the Lord. Why? For his mercies are great. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 19. Nehemiah is speaking in prayer and saying, thou in thy manifold mercies forsakest them not in the wilderness. The children of Israel in the wilderness were provoking God continuously. And yet the testimony of Nehemiah from history is that God in his manifold mercy, leading into another mercy, leading into another mercy, leading into another mercy, manifold mercies forsook them not. God's mercies are great. They're manifold. In Psalm 25 and verse 6. The, the psalmist speaks of God's tender mercies. His mercies are tender. And they have been ever of old. They're from way back a long time ago. Tender in chapter 51 and verse 1 of the book of Psalms. We read about the multitude of thy tender mercies. In Psalm 106 and verse 45. The Bible says he remembered for them his Covenant. How does God remember his covenant? With the rainbow, <laughs> the symbol of mercy. He remembered for them his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. The multitude of his mercies. In Psalm 86 and verse 15, we learn that God is plenteous. In mercy. In Psalm 100 and verse 5, his mercy is everlasting. In Psalm 106 and verse 1, his mercy endureth forever. And in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22, we learn that it's because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, we're not finished, we're not brought to an end. His mercies are new every morning. And by the way, it was these mercies of which we speak 
the mercies that are great and manifold and tender and a multitude and plenteous and everlasting and enduring forever. It's on the basis of those mercies that Paul writes in Romans chapter 12 and says to the Roman church, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. All right, I'm going back now to Psalm chapter 80 and verse 1. So we've established what this means to dwell between the cherubims. And so when he says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. And then in verse 3 and verse 7 and verse 19, he said, Cause thy face to shine. I want you to know that that is the prescribed blessing in the Old Testament. Again, I'm going to turn back. Even though it's going to take us a few moments' time, go back to Numbers chapter 6. Numbers and chapter number 6 and verse 22. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and his sons. Aaron and his sons were the priesthood. Saying, in verse 23, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel. Here's the blessing. Saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. Watch now, the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. So the reason uh, the psalmist in Psalm 80 is saying, Lord, uh, thou that dwellest between the cherubims on the mercy seat, please cause your face to shine, shine forth. Why? Because they knew that when God's face shines toward his people, he is blessing them. His face will shine upon them, verse 25 of Numbers chapter 6, and he will lift up his countenance upon them in verse number 26. All right, now go back with me to the book of Hosea. Back to the book of Hosea and chapter number 5. Hosea chapter number 5. And I want to go to verse number 1. Because when God says in verse 15 that he's going to return to his place... And we've established that's a place of mercy. He's going to go and wait. Who's he talking to? Well, in Hosea chapter 5 and verse 1, Hear ye this, O priests. There's the priesthood, the spiritual leadership. And hearken ye house of Israel. That's the people. So we have the priesthood. We have the people. And give ear, O house of the king. We have the powerful or the ruling class, the political. So the priesthood and the people and the politics, the, pol the political leadership, listen, for judgment is toward you. That's why God's going back to his place. Because of their sin. Judgment is toward you. Look at verse number five. The pride of Israel doth testify to his face. Your face tells a story. And the pride of Israel testifies to God's face. They're not ready to, 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 re, to repent, to turn from their wickedness. They're stubbornly pursuing. Even though I've called them and even though I've warned them, uh, their pride of Israel doth testify to their face. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. Judah also shall fall with them. Remember the Bible warns us, pride goeth before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction or vice versa. But nonetheless, you get the, the message. Look at verse 4. They will not, they will not frame their doings to turn unto their God. What does that mean, frame? It means simply to give or to put or to set. In other words, you and I have control over what we do. And we can choose what we do. And the children of Israel were said that they, they're, the pride their pride testified to God that they would not do what was right. They're just not going to do it. They will not frame their doings to turn unto their God. They want me to turn unto them, but they will not frame their doings to turn unto me. And so he says in chapter 5 and verse 15, I will go and return to my place. I'm going home. I'm going back to my dwelling place, to my seat, to my throne. 
you're going to be without me. These people need revival. This is a sorry condition to be in for people who belong to God. Well, he says there in verse 15, till. I'm going to go return to my place until they. Who's that? The priests, the people, and the politicians. Till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. That's what they're going to have to do. In other words, until they come knocking at my door, I'll be at home. And I'll be there until they come and, Lord, we have sinned. Father, we have offended. Yes, we've been stubborn. Yes, we've been proud. We have transgressed. Until that time, he's going to return to his place. So look at chapter 6 and verse 1. Having heard that from God, here's the response of the people in the voice of Isaiah. Come, everybody, come on, people, priests, uh, politics, politicians, come and let us, let us return unto the Lord. For he hath torn and he will heal. Why? Because he dwells in a place of mercy. That's who he is. He's a merciful God. And so we know that. And though he has forsaken us and though we are getting what we deserve, he will heal us. He has smitten and will bind us up. After two days, will He revive us? He will send us revival. He will give us life again. He will renew our strength and our joy in our life. In the third day, He will raise us up and we shall live in His sight. Now notice this. He will heal. He will bind. He will raise us up. All of that speaks of revival. He'll revive us, and we shall live in His sight. He shall be, uh, notice, then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord. So if we're listening, and we really want Him, and we pursue Him, and we go knocking, His going forth is prepared as the morning. Do you know what most of us do? We're in the house until the morning. And then we get up in the morning and we go out of the house. The Lord has returned to His place. When we follow on to know Him, when we seek Him with all our heart, when we come confessing our transgression and crying out to God for forgiveness, then it says, His going forth is prepared as the morning. And He shall come unto us as the rain and the latter and former rain upon the earth. The rain refreshes and renews and restores and brings back to life again. This is revival. Can I give you a statement this morning that you need to cherish and you need to hide away in your heart? When we begin as a people to complain more of our sins than our afflictions, there will be hope. When we are more burdened about our sin, our transgression, our iniquity, than we are about our struggles and our sorrows and our sufferings, then there will be hope. The only time we come knocking at God's door is because we want God to come back and take away our enemies and take away our troubles and take away our struggles. And God is well able to do that. And God wants to do that. But He can't do that because of our sin. It's when we come saying, God, we do not deserve it. We are unworthy. We are un- unworthy. We just we must have mercy. God, be merciful to us. And we come to acknowledge our transgression. And we come to worship Him and bow before Him and bleed with Him. Then God will spring forth and, and will, will come and save us. Now go with me uh, back to Isaiah 64 where we began this morning. We read this chapter, Isaiah 64, this cry for revival. And uh, for time's sake, we're just going to read verse 4 on a couple of verses. Verse 4 says, since the beginning of the world. Listen carefully now, don't miss this. Don't, Don't be distracted. Since the beginning of the world, if we understand the time frame of man's history on earth, We're thinking in terms of six to seven thousand years. Since the beginning of the world, men, 
have not heard, neither, nor perceived by the ear, neither has the eye seen the three most important senses of our physical being, our hearing, our uh, and our uh, seeing. All, uh, neither have I seen, O oh God, beside thee, only you know, what you have prepared for him that waiteth for him. In other words, those that wait for you, those that come to you, those that humble themselves before you, there's no telling. Nobody's ever even imagined what you've prepared. Oh, my friend, what a reason to return unto the Lord. Now, verse 5, thou meetest him. So remember what God said about the mercy seat back in Exodus chapter 25. There I will meet with thee. Where does God meet with his people? What causes God to come out of his house? Thou meetest him that number one rejoiceth. Number two worketh righteousness. Number three those that remember thee in thy ways. Thou meetest him that rejoices. The word meetest here is not the word which indicates... Two people walking casually along the way, not expecting to see each other, but by chance, they happen to be walking on the same road, coming from two different directions, and they meet each other by chance, by by chance circumstance. That is not the word. The word here, meetest, is a word for falling upon, for seizing upon, uh, for coming upon. Uh, to strike upon, to rush upon. Thou rushest upon, thou strikest upon him that rejoices. You know, the picture is in verse 1. Oh, oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down, fall upon us. That's the idea. Thou meetest him, they're recognizing you meet him that rejoiceth. Let me ask you something this morning. Are you rejoicing in the Lord? I can't remember all the words of the song that Abby sang for us before the message, but that's really what the song was saying. Rejoicing in the Lord. When are we going to come back to the place where we rejoice in God? Because He's God. Because He's our Creator. Because He gave us life. Because everything we have around us and all the beauties we enjoy and all the sweetness and all the goodness is all because of Him. And where are the people of God who just get together and sing praise? Who just worship? Where are the families who around their table and in their car just sing praise to the Lord and rejoice in God and know that no matter what he's doing, no matter what he has done, and no matter what circumstance they find themselves in, he is worthy, always worthy, more than worthy of our worship and our praise and our thanksgiving. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth. Hey, why don't people rejoice in God? I'm going to give you two reasons. Number one, because they have very little truth. They don't know God. You cannot read this book honestly and purposefully to know God without bursting forth in song. Let all those that know the Lord rejoice, the scripture says. And if you know him, that his habitation is a place of mercy where he meets with his people is a seat called mercy, that there's a rainbow around his throne, that he has mercy for thousands, that he's a God who pardons iniquity, a God who forgives. If you know that every good gift and perfect gift that man has ever enjoyed came down from God, Where are the people of God who just praise God, who just love God, who just honor God? Do you suppose there would be a revival in our land if we would just love God? If we would just sing, no matter whether we're in prison or whether we're in a park or in a paradise, it doesn't matter. He is still God and He's worthy of our praise and God falls upon those that rejoice. But we don't rejoice because we have little truth or... Secondly, because we have little trust. Oh, we've heard the truth. We've been to church. We've read the Bible. We know what the Bible says about our God, but we don't trust Him. How are you going to rejoice in someone you can't trust? But if you trust Him, if you know that nothing is impossible for Him, if you know that the judge of all the earth will always do right, 
If you know that he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think, why would you not rejoice? But people are not rejoicing because they're not trusting. They're trusting in the bank. They're trusting in science. They're trusting in their own wisdom. They're trusting in somebody's counsel. But they're not trusting in the Lord. If you really know God, you can trust in him. And when you trust in him, you will rejoice. I could give you verse after verse after verse. I don't have time. Look them up. I'm telling you, God meets those that rejoice and those that work righteousness. That simply means they labor at doing right. They are trying to do right. In the words we read in chapter 5 of Hosea, they are framing their doings unto God. They are trying. They're not perfect, but they have a desire to do right. They want to know what's right. They want to know what's wrong. And when they know what's right, they're determined to do right. They're not perfect, and sometimes they slip up, and sometimes they fail. But God knows the heart, and He knows whether they're framing their doings or working their, their life in a righteous pattern. And finally, it says, who remember thee in thy ways. So when we rejoice, that's faith. We rejoice because He is, and we trust Him. So God meets those in faith and repentance. That's working righteousness, so doing what's right, and in submission. Those that remember thee in thy ways, or the ways that you walk, walk on your path, follow your footsteps. In other words, those that rejoice and do right, in a way that's pleasing unto Him. Can I suggest to you that sometimes that's our biggest problem? You notice in the midst of this psalm, uh, in, in the midst of this verse, Behold, thou art wroth. God, we, we understand you're angry because we've sinned. In those, going back to rejoicing, working righteousness, remembering God in His ways, In those is continuance, and we shall be saved. We know, we know that when you meet with us, it will be because we're doing these things, but we also know that you're angry with us because we're not doing those things. And if we do those things, we shall be saved. So here's their confession. Remember, he said, I'm going to go back to my place until they acknowledge their sins. We are all as an unclean thing as, and all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. You know what it's saying? Our condition is not one we desire, but our condition is one that we justly deserve. We don't desire to be in this condition in our land, in our home, in our churches, in our family, but this is what we deserve for we have sinned. We know what we must do to be saved, but we are continuing. And so when he says uh, we are as an unclean thing, he's talking about their person. When he says all of our righteousness is as filthy rags, that's our performances. So our person is, is unclean. Our performances are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. Our perseverance, our perseverance We're all the time going away. Hosea chapter 6 and verse 4, God says to his people, Your goodness is like the morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goeth away. We're not persevering. So the problem is our persons, we're unclean. And our performances are are unclean. And our, our perseverance is suspect. You remember it says here that God will meet him that Remember him in his ways. What are the ways of God? As opposed to being unclean, God is holy. As opposed to having a faulty performance, God is right and righteous. And as opposed to fading as a leaf, God is faithful. We're not at all like God. But if we would frame our doings to be like God, to be holy, to be right, to do right in the right way, and and to be faithful at it, we can expect God's blessing. All right, we're about to close now, but I need to tell you that if we were had the time, we'd go back and check Isaiah 58 and 59, and I want to encourage you to do that. In Isaiah chapter 59, God addresses the fact that they were expecting Him to show up 
They were expecting him to do something. And, that, and he said, you're seeking me every day. In verse number 2, delighting to know my ways, Psalm 50, uh, or Isaiah 58. And verse number 2, and yet you're not doing what you ought to do. That's what the whole chapter is about. And chapter 59, the same thing. It's about what they're doing that they're not supposed to do. So here, listen carefully. The problem with Israel, with God's people, was not just that they were doing what was wicked, and that's all listed in chapter 59. Lying, stealing, abusing, uh, adultery, all of those kinds of things. things. It wasn't just that they were doing what was wicked, but in chapter 58, he tells them first what they were not doing that is right. They were not loving the poor. They, they were pointing the finger and mistreating one another. And, and so he deals with the things that are right and the things that God would do that you're not doing. That was in chapter 58. And then the things that you're doing that you should not be doing in chapter 59. Here's what the problem is, church. We so often in our lives do only that which is designed to appease God. And not that which is designed to to please God. If you've ever had children, you'll recognize that scenario where your children have not done that which is pleasing to you and recognizing it and seeing your anger or seeing your disappointment, they will then try to appease you. But what you want is not for them to appease you. You want for them to do that which pleases you. And as a godly parent, you'll try to teach them and you'll correct them and you'll bring them to the place where they desire to please you. Well, verse 7 is where we end. Isaiah 64 and verse 7. There's so much more, but we'll end here. There is none. Here was the problem. There is none that calleth upon thy name. Are you there, Lord? Oh, Lord. Oh, God. None. Let me ask you a question. In the last nine weeks or ten weeks or whatever it's been since we began this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, how often have you called upon the Lord? And has it increased? Have you felt your need to cry out to God? Uh, there is none. They, they had to be honest and say, not only are we not right, and we know that if we were right, you would fall upon us. You would meet us. Now we're crying out to you. There's none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself. Not somebody else having to fan the flames, but stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. There's none of us that recognize our desperate condition and our need of you. For thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. You know, I remember in the, in the very beginning of the Bible when man sinned against God, God came calling, Adam, where art thou? Perhaps he said, Adam, Eve. Where art thou? God calling upon us. But where is the man? Where is the woman? Where is the boy? Where is the girl that's crying out, God, oh God, we need you. Oh God, shine unto us. Oh God, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. There's none. And so this week, this week, as we are privileged to hear the messages of God's servants throughout the week about, the mess, sir, about revival, would you give yourself to calling upon the Lord and stir up yourself to take hold of Him? The idea of taking hold means you tie yourself to it. It means to bind. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get a hold or you're going to take a hold of God and you're not going to let go. You're going to persevere. Your, your goodness is not going to fade like a leaf. You're not going to just do it for an hour or one day or two days. You're going to, every day that you live, you're going to lay hold of God. You're going to persevere. You're going to be like Him and be faithful in your pursuit of Him. God's face is always shining. But for a time, it may be hid from us because of our sins. And we need to remember who He is and where He lives and turn back to Him and come with words and confess our sin and then frame our doings in such a way that we are showing Him we're serious about doing right. And when we do, He said, I'm going to be at home. I'm going to be in my place until they acknowledge their sins or their transgressions. And then His 
face will shine toward us again. And he will come upon us. And he will be like the rain and the refreshing dew. Oh, we need revival. Oh, would to God that we would knock on God's door. Today, tomorrow, and every day, knock on God's door. He's been knocking at our door for a long time, and we haven't answered. We've been too busy watching TV. We've been too busy pursuing enjoyments and uh, traveling the world and, and having all of our fun and, and uh, enjoying all of our fancies. So God's gone home, and He's waiting till we acknowledge our transgressions. Let's knock together on God's door with confident faith and a heart full of rejoicing in the fact that our God dwells on a mercy seat. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you this morning for the opportunity to look into your word and to hear the voice of your servants as you stirred them to teach your people, to challenge your people, to convict your people. And I pray that each of us who've heard this message and considered these verses this morning would be led of you to return and Lord, for us to realize that, that there's our side of the bargain. You are faithful and you've never changed. It's we that change uh, with the seasons and with the winds. Oh God, help us. Help me. Oh God, help me and help your people to fall in love with you and to love you always and to rejoice in you, to frame our, our doings to do that which is right and to persevere. Father, thank you that we have every expectation that you will in time, in your good time, break forth upon us and revive us. Maybe after two days, maybe after three, but you will revive us again. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been primarily addressing the people who know God, the people who have come to be reconciled to God through faith in God's Son, the Lord Jesus, who died for them on Calvary's cross. It's only those people who have ever experienced true life. The man or woman who's never known peace with God through Jesus Christ is described in Scripture as being dead. You can't revive something uh, that hasn't been alive at once. And so I've been preaching about revival, but you can be made alive again if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Right now you're dead in trespasses and sin, and only the mercy of God obtained by the blood of Christ can atone for your sin, not your works, not your righteousness, nothing else. And so if you've heard this message this morning and you not, know you're not a child of God, you're not born again by faith in Jesus Christ, Please, I plead with you, give us a call, send us an email, and allow us the opportunity to answer your questions and to show you from the Word of God how you today can pass from death into life and be a part of the glorious family of God. Thank you so much for listening today. There's a couple things I would remind you about. Today, beginning uh, at 11 o'clock uh, Central Standard Time, uh, is an online Canadian revival, co conference on revival. There are several preachers scheduled, and today uh, at 11 o'clock their time, and again in the evening, uh, I think it's at 7 o'clock their time, uh, Dr. Rick Flanders will be preaching. So here's what we're planning to do as a church. We're planning tonight at our 5 o'clock service, uh, we will be uh, showing you the morning message uh, that is being preached out uh, in Saskatchewan uh, by Dr. Flanders to begin the revival. So tonight, uh, I will not be preaching, we'll be we'll be. Uh, showing you uh, that message, uh, the first message of the Revival Conference. And then we'll show you the second message in our live stream tomorrow morning. And then Monday evening at 7 o'clock on our website or through our stream, we will be showing you the third message and so forth. So every night this week, Monday, or starting tonight, Sunday, through Friday, every night, tonight at 5 o'clock, the other night's at 7 o'clock, We'll be showing you one of the messages at 10 o'clock every morning, Monday through Saturday. We'll be showing you one of those revival messages. And I'm going to be praying as a pastor that as God speaks to my heart, God will speak to your heart. And we encourage you to be a part of this Canadian revival. We also want to remind you uh, that we are still, until Father's Day, still trying to raise support uh, for the Atwell Center. 
uh, and uh, the Formula for Hope campaign. And you can find that. It's right there on your screen. You can also find it on our website. And we encourage you to go to that and uh, to give as the Lord has, has prospered you and as God enables you. And again, I want to thank you, church, for being faithful in your giving. I didn't bring the missions figures with me to the pulpit today. We're a bit behind in our missions giving uh, for the first three weeks of our new missions year. And uh, the general fund is lagged behind a little bit, but thanks to all of you who've been faithful in sending in your tithes and offerings and dropping them off at the church and, and doing it electronically. We appreciate that so much and encourage you to continue to be faithful uh, to do that. Looking forward again uh, to the services this week. I'll not be preaching now again until, I guess, next Sunday, uh, but uh, I will see you perhaps before each service, chat with you for a second, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, God working our hearts and moving us toward revival as it pleases Him during the course of this week. God bless you. Thanks you for listening this morning.